from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. Part of the job of an educator is to order our loves. In other words, to put them in some sort of ranked order and see to it that we are primarily committed to the loves which are most worthy. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Dr. John Fidel, Professor Emeritus of Education at Hillsdale College and also co-author of a new paper, An Epistemological Rationale for Classical Education. We talk about classical education and Dr. Fidel's work today on the show. Dr. Fidel, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you today. The, the title of the paper that you wrote is An Epistemological Rationale for Classical Education. What is epistemology? What does it mean to have an epistemological rationale? Well, one of my dictionaries defines epistemology as the study or a theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge. In other words, epistemology is an account of what it is to know, how we know, etc., and rationale has really two uh, two meanings, depending on the context. One context uh, is explanation. So re- a rationale can be an explanation of how something works. The second context is justification. So rationale there could be a justification for a proposed objective or some end. In our paper, my co-author Tim Simpson and I aim to provide both. We, we want to uh, provide an account of how we know, especially how classical education enables people, builds character, etc. And also we want to provide an argument that we ought to adopt classical education. So our paper in providing an epistemological rationale is both an explanation and a recommendation. In this paper, which people can find online in Principia, it's volume two, number one, you refer to the sort of person we would like to see emerge from schooling. What more can you tell us about that? Well, I used to teach philosophy of education at the college, as you know, and I always emphasize that educators, whether they realize it or not, are in the business of cultivating a certain sort of person. And to the degree that we teach intelligently, our our practice is driven and inspired by a human ideal, a concept of human fruition. Now, classical education is quite consciously in the service of a human ideal, and in the paper, Dr. Simpson and I indicate that there is both an intellectual and moral dimension to man. That is why classical education, while honoring its ideal, is explicitly committed to cultivation of the mind as well as of the heart. Now, classical educators are very much involved in character formation. If we are successful in this enterprise, the young, when they are adults, will be just as committed to educating their young as we are to educating them. In short, By proceeding in this fashion, the chain of civilization remains intact. Talking with Dr. John Fennell, his piece is in Principia, a journal of classical education. This paper also heavily features the thought of Harry Brody referencing the illusionary store. What is that, and why is it important? Well, this concept shows the powerful influence on Brody of a prominent philosopher named Michael Polanyi and the epistemology that Polanyi articulated. Illusionary store is Brody's term for the largely tacit reservoir of principles, concepts, and images, what he calls stencils, and that each of us has, and that we tap when we try to understand the world, when we try to see the world, including, most notably, perhaps, understanding ourselves. When we look about ourselves, look around the world, we see or understand in terms of the concepts and categories that are contained in the illusionary store. Now, this illusionary store is in large measure the product of a fertile, mandated curriculum. And this leads to one of our primary justifications of classical education. Now, for Brody, a primary purpose of schooling is to richly stock this illusionary store. Now, due to the rich store and its enduring influence, the young, later older people, are enabled to live a good life. And I want to emphasize that concept, enablement. I would say that enablement 
is a characteristic of any practice that merits the term educational. Now, some of our listeners are going to recognize in this discussion a connection to E.D. Hirsch and mm-hmm. his concept of cultural literacy. If we had more time, we could go into more detail on this. There is a strong parallel between Brody's Illusionary Store and Hirsch's Cultural Literacy Project. So why are the arts and the humanities a vital component of a good education? Well, there's a really good and uh, rather, uh, can I say, complex answer to that question. Let me begin by saying that Brody was a world leader in what is known as aesthetic education. Now, aesthetic education refers to the use of the arts and humanities to cultivate our tastes. In other words, young people do not have cultivated tastes, and one of our jobs is to cultivate them. Also, aesthetic education has a vital role to play in ordering our loves. Now, that's a a phrase that some listeners will recognize, but others may find that perplexing. Let, Let me explain. When I was teaching philosophy of education, I elected to teach St. Augustine. And St. Augustine is extremely insightful on this matter. He says that we are best understood as individuals in terms of that which we love. And Brody, I think, is very sensitive to this. He's saying that part of the job of an educator is to order our loves. In other words, to put them in some sort of ranked order and see to it that we are primarily committed to the loves which are most worthy. And so the aesthetic education that Brody's involved in does that. And the arts and humanities have a key role in that aesthetic education. Now, Brody understands, as does uh, people like Polanyi and St. Augustine, that as human beings, we act in accordance with images that are in, in our mind. Now, Brody would say, well, those are images in our illusionary store. By acting under the influence of these positive and negative images, we demonstrate the kind of person that we are. The arts and humanities are an indispensable source of those images, and those images oftentimes come in the form of exemplars. And these exemplars can be real people or fictional people. Uh, Think of Socrates, for example. Mm -hmm. Many listeners will remember the courage that was displayed in the Apology, and some listeners will remember his equanimity in the face of death in the Phaedo. And we also think of people like Achilles and even Harry Potter and Atticus Finch, from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. These are all exemplars. The arts and humanities bring these exemplars into the lives of the young. They lodge in the illusionary store, and they are responsible for the way we act later, which is what we call our character. Hence, these things need to be a central feature of our K-12 education system. And I would add, in closing on this matter, that we have as much to learn from C.S. Lewis as we might learn from Brody and Polanyi. In connection with K-12 education, especially in in public schools, much is said about the necessity of providing equal opportunity for all. What would you say to someone who asserts that a a liberal arts curriculum is not appropriate for every child and and perhaps stands in the way for some of that opportunity? Well, I'd say a couple things. Uh, First, I would say they aren't thinking very clearly. (laughs) Uh, But secondly, uh, I would ask that we all recall this notion of enabling or enablement that I mentioned a moment ago. Classical education is especially, even uniquely, capable of enabling the young throughout their lives to understand the world and thereby be effective in it. Now, this enabling comes not only through arts and humanities, it comes through science and many other of the disciplines, but the the, uh, thing I want to emphasize is that People who are properly educated, especially through a rich curriculum like classical education offers, develop a sense of mastery of the world. They understand things. They understand more things. They understand them better. And that, in turn, leads to confidence. Also, those who profit from a a good classical education are inspired by images of moral excellence. They, They know how to act. They know that certain ways of acting are proper and will lead to rewarding ends. So as a result of having this rich curriculum, this classical education, people become more capable, more effective, etc. And I would say that this enabling is the most important thing we can do to achieve equality of opportunity through education. 
And this is true of young people of all backgrounds and all levels of intellectual ability. We're talking with Dr. John Fennell. He is the author of a piece, An Epistemological Rationale for Classical Education, a report in Principia, a journal of classical education. He's also a professor emeritus of education at Hillsdale College. What is the connection between intellectual enhancement and moral development? Well, this uh, points to one of the more complex uh, aspects of the paper, but it's very important. In the paper, we argue that there's a reciprocal relationship between intellectual enhancement and moral development. By this, we mean two things. First, that persons of salutary character, people who have healthy character, who have ordered loves that we discussed earlier, will be inspired to enrich in their understanding of the world. In other words, their character gives rise to a interest in learning more about the world. Their character uh, aids and embeds a kind of intellectual development. So, for example, properly ordered lives, pro- properly ordered loves, will lead people to want to understand the truth more clearly. They will, they will want to exercise proper reasoning, and they will have a disdain for the opposite. The reciprocal here is that moral excellence and excellence of character are frequently the fruit of appropriately guided intellectual development. In other words, we have to learn someplace mm-hmm. what it means to have good character, etc. And so in the, same ma- in the same way that good character and moral development leads to intellectual development, intellectual development in turn leads to a kind of moral development. Now in the paper, we point out that we ought not to artificially separate these two processes. They are instead, as we say, two moments in a single education. You also use the term enlightened cherishing in this paper. What does that mean, and how does it connect to the central aim of classical education, which you identify as character formation? Well, enlightened cherishing is Brody's term, and it's uh, remarkably apt. At first glance, it seems a little peculiar, but the more you think about it, the more you see why the words are very well chosen. What Brody means to talk about here is is this. Every individual is attracted to and loves something. Even Even the drug dealers and the gang members love something. Each of us cherishes one thing or another. Brody emphasizes repeatedly that it's our job as educators, indeed as adults, to take the steps necessary so that the young love and cherish the proper things. They're going to love and cherish something, And it's our job to intervene into their lives and be sure that they end up loving and cherishing the right things Mm -hmm. and having a disdain for the wrong things. Brody calls this value education or value reconditioning. Now, that term's going to frighten some people, but it's really (laughs) a a multi-syllable word saying that we're exercising our responsibility. The arts and humanities, as well as the personal example of exemplars, and I, w- and I would use the term stories broadly understood to include all of that, the, all of these things are especially effective in accomplishing this value education or value reconditioning. It's a hallmark of classical education to provide abundant such stories. And if you look, think back to the early grades, you can remember some of the fairy tales and so forth. Mm-hmm. And in, in, the, in, the, in the later grades, uh, we read more sophisticated literature. But once again, it's the value of stories, the value of exemplars in the process of developing in the young appropriate values. Now, the ultimate product of all this is a sort of person that we've been talking about since the beginning of our of our discussion. And we mean here, by all this, the process of character formation. What do you regard as the central statement of your paper? What, what's the main idea you hope people come away with? Well, in the way of introduction, let me just say that formally the paper is a warning and a plea that classical educators not fall prey to a dangerously narrow conception of assessment and accountability. There's a lot of pressure on uh, headmasters, principals, as well as boards to show in some quantitative fashion what the school has accomplished. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially when it comes to uh, mathematics and reading comprehension. 
But what Brody is pointing out, based on Polanyi's epistemology, is that the most important things that go on in a school are not going to be captured by these mechanisms of assessment and accountability. Mm -hmm. And and we, we, we wrote the article in large measure to reassure these leaders in the classical education movement that it's okay to emphasize things that are not going to show up on a standardized test. In fact, the, these things are the most important things, and you, you can't abandon them and still be practicing classical education. But at a deeper level, what the essay is about is the inner workings of character formation. And at the top of page 94, we make the following statement, and I'm, I'm quoting us here. Character is the product of a commitment made incumbent by the aesthetic appeal of images encountered during earlier education. Now, uh, Dr. Simpson pointed out to me, that sounds pretty highfalutin, so let me take a minute. <laughs> let me read it again. Character is the product of a commitment made incumbent, incumbent means obligatory, by the aesthetic appeal of images encountered during earlier education. What we're trying to say in this, for, in this statement is that we're in the business of developing character, and the way that is done is by producing in the minds and the souls of the young a commitment. Now, we're, how does that done? What we're reminding people is what Brody tells us, is that we become committed to attractive images of behavior, attractive images of outcomes, and those attractive uh, images are brought to into the lives of the young through this rich curriculum. Now, Brody uses a, another interesting term. He says, seduction to commitment, which sounds really ominous, hmm. but it really is innocent. What he's saying is, is that we surround the young with images. You know, remember uh, images from the Bible or mm -hmm. images from uh, C.S. Lewis or images from uh, the great novelists. Also, some of these images come in the form of sound, you know, in the form of music, and they come in the form of, of dance, even. There are many ways that images are, are communicated. And what Brody is saying is, we, just like Plato says in the Republic, we surround the young with these attractive images, and they become seduced by them. They want to be like that. They're aesthetically appealing. And we do this through what uh, we call, generally speaking, stories. Not just literature, but exemplars and works of art and so forth. All of this is done in, in order to produce what we what we have called enlightened cherishing that we already discussed. Mm -hmm. Dr. John Fennell, last question for you about this paper. Well, actually, it's about a larger thing. It's about classical education. It has been in the news. There has been much attention to it these past couple of months, certainly in past couple of years. If our listeners are interested in what we've been talking about, where would you recommend they go next? Well, the first thing, of course, is they should read our article. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's available online. Uh, Principia has a very attractive website, and they provide all this content without any, any charge, which is nice. So read the article. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, uh, I urge uh, readers or listeners who will be readers, to follow up by investigating the authors and the resources that we cite in the paper. In particular, Brody has a little book, it's out of print, but it's still available, a little book called The Uses of Schooling. And it's, it's only like 85 pages long or something, but it's full of insight. So, you know, look at Brody's book, The Uses of Schooling, and also the other sources in the paper. That's the second thing. The third thing uh, Dr. Simpson and I are committed to spreading the word. This is not the only article we have co-authored. We, we did three of them in the last 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is is contribute to the growth of classical education uh, in a variety of ways, and this paper is one of those ways. And we are ready to do, to uh, speak about this in person. So uh, the third thing people can do, they can call upon us to uh, visit, can conduct workshops, conduct professional development uh, for teachers or board members or whatever. And we can also speak uh, even to parents uh, who might be contemplating uh, opening up a classical school. Dr. John Fennell, you can find that piece again at Principia, a journal of classical education and epistemological rationale for classical education Dr. Fennell, also a professor emeritus of education at Hillsdale College. 
Dr. Fidel, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. It's been my pleasure to be here. Up next, we talk with Coach Joe Kennedy, author of the book Average Joe and winner of a Supreme Court case on religious liberty. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. It's at podcasts.hillsdale.edu. Find older episodes of this program plus other fine Hillsdale podcasts like The Larry Arn Show, Imprimus, and the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined now by Coach Joe Kennedy. He won a landmark religious liberty case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court recently. Also the author of the new book, Average Joe, One Man's Faith and the Fight to Change a Nation. You can find more at CoachJoeKennedy.com. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Congratulations on the new book and the Supreme Court win. I don't know how closely our listeners were following that Supreme Court case, which was an important Supreme Court case. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit what happened to lead everything up until that moment in the Supreme Court. What was that incident, the scenario that led you to to eventually stand in front of those justices? Yeah. So it started out with me making uh, my covenant with God to give thanks after every football game. Uh, win or lose. And that's what I did. I did that for eight years at Bremerton High School, which is uh, up by Seattle, Washington. And yeah, I just I was just doing that. The kids asked if they could come out and I told them it was a free country. They could do it. And next thing you know, eight years later, somebody saw what we were doing, gave a compliment to the school district and the school district frowned upon it and ended up letting me go and firing me for uh, exercise of my First Amendment rights. So we took him to court. We lost seven times in a row and uh, finally got to the Supreme Court for the second time. And they actually ruled on the Constitution and also the facts of the case, which was awesome. People, perhaps by reading some media stories, might misinterpret what was happening. So I want to make sure we're clear about a few uh, details. One is it was not a required team activity. Uh, two, it, it was not in the course of the game. It was after the game was concluded. What else should people know about that they might be misinformed about your case? Yeah, really, it, those are the two key positions on that. And uh, at, oh, one other thing is also the school district, when they told me to stop praying with my team, I did. And I never prayed with uh, my Bremerton Knights again. But then they saw me doing it by myself still, and that's what uh, was the final trigger. So it wasn't even me praying with with my team anymore. It became about one person taking the knee and giving thanks after a football game. Average Joe is the book coach. Joe Kennedy is with us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Why, Why did you do it? You explained why you wanted to pray. Why do it publicly, and why was it so important for you to do it in in that manner? Well, that was originally my covenant from when I saw the movie Facing the Giants. And just like the the coach did there, he was going to give glory to God, win or lose after the game. 
And that's what I did. And since it was my right as an American, I served as a Marine for 20 years. And I, I think I understood what the First Amendment says of the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. But that's where we kind of got our wires crossed. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I could have prayed anywhere. Uh, but the big deal was it, it, it wasn't a big deal. It was that one guy taking a knee after a game being thankful, which is not really newsworthy in, in my mind, nor is it worth firing somebody over. <laughs> but um, I am a man of principle, and um, it was a principle of it. Of You cannot tell people that they have to choose between their faith and and their job. That's just that's not the America I, I signed up for and not the one I want to live in. You you could have simply stopped. You, you could have found a job elsewhere, perhaps. You, you could have stopped after a few losses along the way in court. What drove you to take this all the way to the high court, despite the, the you know extreme length of time, expense, all of that? What drove you to take this all the way? Well, there was a couple of reasons. One of them was my football team itself. Uh, I've always told my guys to stand up for what is right, even if it's not popular. And when they asked me, coach, can't you just give give in and, and you know, not fight this fight? I mean, this is going to cause us, all, you know, all kinds of havoc in, on our team and for our season. And when they said that, I knew right there in that moment that, number one, I needed to stand up because I tell these guys to do the same thing. Now, all of a sudden, it's going to I'm going to stop and I'm going to give up because it became uncomfortable. So I wanted to set a good example and show leadership by example. And then the second one was there were so many people in our community, especially in at our high school and in our school district that were believers, um, like the superintendent. He's a good friend of mine, was and still is a good friend of mine. And he couldn't stand up for what was right. What was he going to do? Go against uh, his lawyers? So I knew he wanted to do the right thing. But if if somebody could get bullied like that, then somebody needs to stand up. And as an American, I just I'm so tired of people getting ran over and us little guys getting squashed. So I was going to make my stand on that hill. As I mentioned, this took a, a long time. Uh, seven years, I believe, is the length of time for these court cases to make it through all the way to the Supreme Court. Along the way, did you consider the downside, the risk personally to you to, to go through all of this? I, well, I'm very much so because I was living it every day. I was putting my wife and my kids through, you know, through, I hate to say it, but through hell on earth. It, it was terrible for everybody. And, but it was absolutely 100% worth it. And the biggest thing that I, another reason I couldn't quit is after they ruled, they said any display of, of religion in the public square could get you fired. That was my hugest uh, fear was that that would stick. And I just lost all of all Americans, their, their rights as, you know, free citizens to pray in public. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a no win situation. I only had one way to go, and that was to turn that back around. Talking to Coach Joe Kennedy. You can find more at CoachJoeKennedy.com. He is the author of the new book, Average Joe and also won that landmark religious liberty case in front of the Supreme Court. Take us through that day or, or or those days around the ruling by the Supreme Court, Coach Kennedy. How did you find out? What did you think when you heard the ruling from the Supreme Court? Well, uh, the week before, uh, I'm, I think you remember uh, the Dobbs case, which was the Roe versus Wade uh, um, that got overturned. Mm -hmm. And that came out a week before ours, which was just shocking. I thought that was going to be the last one of the year. So I didn't know where mine was going to line up. And I was sitting in a conference room with my lawyers down in Plano, Texas, at, uh, with uh, First Liberty Institute. And we were waiting to see what pops up. It might have been that one or the next week. We knew we only had two weeks left. And when ours popped up that Monday, I I, I just, I mean, all of us kind of looked at each other with, oh my gosh, here it is. And then as soon as uh, they got done reading it, I kept trying to bug them, trying to find out well, what happened, what happened. And they were like, shh, you won, 6-3, let us finish reading. <laughs> so I had to sit there waiting for them to finish reading it. And then it was just a mad rush to tell the world about it. We did 87 interviews in the next three days. So we didn't get a chance to actually celebrate. It was just sharing the news everywhere in the world. What did that mean for you on a practical level? I mean, your job and all those things, but also on a personal level. 
It, it really gave me hope for for America. Uh, you hear so much bad things and all the you know things that are going on in the world, and it just shows that you know if one person can stand up and they can make a difference. Imagine what the rest of us could do when we all stand up together. So there is hope for everybody. And you know, on the private side of it, it was you know it was nice to hear that somebody actually read the facts of the case and ruled by what the constitution says so i felt you know like man finally somebody told me that i didn't do anything wrong and i was right all along okay i was going to ask about that so you, you said you had some hope for the country hope for, hope for america did you leave this entire ordeal with more faith in the system because of the result did it leave you questioning the process? Were you were you sort of disgusted by the lengths you had to go to just to assert this right? Oh yes, I, at the very beginning, I thought we could just work this out as adults, and, and imagine that sitting down and actually talking about this <laughs> and coming to some kind of resolution. And then when we went to the first court, I figured, okay, this will be it. We got to put a stop to this nonsense. And when the judge said, hey, I don't see anything wrong with praying except for um, because of the political climate, I can't rule in your favor. And I was I was floored. I Really? I mean, we're talking about the political climate. You're supposed to rule on fact of the case. So I lost all of my respect and, and all my trust in, in the lower courts. I, I was just shocked, especially when I went to the Ninth Circuit and it was like they personally had an ax to grind against me. And man, I. I, I felt beat up by the time it got to the, you know, to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and we had to start it all over again and they doubled down and yeah, it was, it was absolutely crazy. And, and you know, at least I, I have faith in America now, but all the way through for eight years, I was questioning mm -hmm. and thinking, my God, how can anybody live through this? This Supreme Court ruling has, uh, has an effect on you personally, of course, but a much larger effect as well because of the precedent it sets for future cases. What are some things that other Americans now can do, perhaps without fear, because you won this fight? Yeah, well, simply things is, is any dis display of your faith. Uh, you remember the the Ten Commandments that have been um, up in public square and mm -hmm. those have all been taken down. All of those can come back up. You could pray in school. You could have a Bible verse in your classroom. Uh, you you are free to exercise your rights as an American, like the way it was atten intended. Because this this was uh, made up 50 years ago and with bad with bad law, and we've been under the assumption that you know there's this big separation of church and state in a way that it was never meant to be. So this frees up everybody to actually live out their faith in the way that they see, not having to worry about anybody, you know, coming against them or losing their job or even having any kind of uh, discrimination against them. Coach Joe Kennedy, Average Joe is the book. You can find more at CoachJoeKennedy.com. The book, of course, includes this story, your story, Coach. And we've talked a lot about the court case today. What else will people learn? What more is in Average Joe? Yeah, it's 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 really to tell you the the I, I thought God had the wrong guy. And, you know, I still question him on that because it goes back to um, when I, even when I was conceived, I, I was a unwanted pregnancy and I was in and out of group homes and foster homes when I was a kid. So I went I, I went through um, some major trials, but all during that, it just made me stronger to be ready for this fight. And it tells about my family going through all this and, and the relationship with my wife. So it's a really good love story about my love for my wife, my love for our country, and my love of God. And I think everybody's going to be just fascinated with, you know, all the details of this. Like, I had no idea. Instead of just reading a headline, you actually get to read what, what a, an average Joe is in America <laughs> and that they can make a difference. Coach Joe Kennedy, author of the new book, Average Joe, One Man's Faith and the Fight to Change a Nation. You can find out more at CoachJoeKennedy.com. Coach, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Up next, Dr. Christopher Bush from Hillsdale's English Department returns for his series on the poetry of Robert Frost. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.
Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I've got a challenge for you today. Become a better educated American citizen. And to help you do just that, we at Hillsdale College have our free online courses available for all who wish to learn. Our challenge? Take just one of our courses. There are so many to choose from. You can discover the beauty of the Bible in the Genesis story, study the writings of C.S. Lewis, or explore the true meaning of America in Constitution 101. We have dozens more to choose from, and all these self-paced free courses feature Hillsdale faculty and scholars, many you've heard on this podcast. So visit hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and pick one of the more than 30 free Hillsdale courses. I hope you'll accept my challenge. Pick whichever course you like and become a more educated citizen today. Go to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. You can get an email every time there's a new episode of the program. Go to radiohour.hillsdale.edu. Click subscribe and enter your email address. You'll always know about new releases from the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. We're joined by Dr. Christopher Bush, professor of English here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Bush, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Scott. Uh, Continuing our series on Robert Frost, we spent some time on his life and a biographical look last time. This time through, I want to talk about the styles, the themes that permeate the work of Robert Frost. And I I thought I'd suggest some ideas and perhaps you can can help illuminate those points and maybe give some examples of of them in Frost's work. Absolutely. So these themes that, that recur throughout his poems, one is the difficult nature of the self- understanding existence. Where where do we see that pop up through his work? Well, I think uh, Frost probably addresses that in in much of his poetry. Um, The the question of existence, of course, is a a big big question. So we might think about it in terms of what does it it mean to be human? And uh, what is the context uh, in which we live? And sometimes I think, um, you know, actually looking at a poem can help us to to understand that. And existence, uh, if we take a look at the poem Birches, for example, existence in that poem is is really a contest, I guess you could say, or a, a struggle between what the way that we we wish the world to be and the way that it is, and how we struggle with that um, with that kind of contention. The poem Birches begins, When I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, dark, darker trees, I like to think some boys bend swinging them. And so the speaker begins by saying, this is the way that I would like the world to be, a place where people play, a place where we are always young. But then he follows that up by saying, but swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. And that's the the other pole of the poem. That's the reality. The reason that birch trees are permanently bent over in the woods is not because someone's been playing on them, but it's because of ice storms. And I think what he's really saying is that that is, that is the, the struggle, you might say, or the, the thing that we must contend with in life, in our existence. What we would like to be, the world that we would like to live in, is often not the world uh, that is. And so what he contends with throughout the poem then is how, you know, how do we come to some peace, some place of, of understanding about that? And he gets to the end of the poem and he says, I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow white trunk toward heaven till the tree would, should set me down again. That would be good, both going and coming back. And he ends the poem by saying, one could do worse than be a swinger of birches. <laughs> so I think what's really powerful about that poem in relation to this question of existence is that we want to hold intention, our dream, 
our wish, our hope of what it is to be human and what this world is like. But we also need to recognize the reality of the ice storm. Mm -hmm. And so it's between heaven and, uh, you know, the ground, I suppose you could say, where I think Frost often lives. He lives in that space. Birches has trees and an ice storm discussed. Nature is, is, is a frequent uh, topic for his work and his poems. And thematically, the ambiguity of nature when it's considered a source of wisdom. What do we see from Frost there? I, I think the way that nature works in Robert Frost's poetry is that it becomes the central uh, metaphor in so many ways as he's talking about his philosophical concerns. So the way that I like to think about it is that he will begin with often a person in a scene uh, in nature. And so it might be in Stopping Road Woods on a Snowy Evening or The Road Not Taken or Birches. And often a very, it's a, often a rural scene, a very simple scene, a place where one might find oneself at just any day, really. Mm -hmm. It's not something unique. Uh, and then he will use that as a springboard into uh, some of the, the deepest and most philosophical discussions. So I think nature, in some poems, clearly nature is there and nature is the subject. But I think more often nature is is the metaphor hmm. that he uses to as a way of getting getting to his main concern or his main interest in the poems. Talking with Dr. Christopher Bush about the works of Robert Frost, themes and styles, come back in a moment, but a little side conversation here. You, you told us last time that one of the reasons you were drawn to Robert Frost is he's a poet who wants to be understood. But there's often uh, a hidden complexity in his themes. How do those two elements get balanced? Yes, yes. So again, in, in an interview, Robert Frost likened his poetry to um, playing a children's game called, uh, you know, Snap the Whip or Crack the Whip. So children in you know, the one-room schools would all join hands and they would run around the, the field and uh, whoever was the leader would get to decide which direction they go and might make a 180-degree turn. Well, that would send the whole lines going way around and the one on the very end would really have to hang on. And so what Robert Frost said in the interview was that's what his poetry is like. He said, are you still with me? You know, are you still hanging on? And I think that's really illustrated that uh, he says he said that you know don't make the mistake that Ezra Pound made, a very very important poet. He says uh, he says I'm not undesigning, and I think what's really powerful about that is is this sense that his poetry appears uh, to be very simple. It has simple diction. It has simple settings, characters that seem to be somewhat uncomplicated. But I think what we really see as we dig deeper, and we just have to notice is, is what we have to do. We have to notice what he says. Uh, and there's always going to be a gleam in his eye. He's going to say, are you getting it? Because he will sometimes lay traps <laughs> for us. And uh, so we really have to pay attention. One of those traps might be his ability and his use and development of, of metaphors throughout his work. Where, where do we see that perhaps most striking in some of his poems? Well, if we look at, for example, The Road Not Taken, one of his um, probably most read, widely read poems. And um, first of all, he uses the um, simple setting of a traveler coming up to a fork in the road and uh, trying to decide which way to go. Well, so, um, and he talks about, you know, that the it's a yellow wood. He says, uh, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. Uh, so it's fall. And he gives us this beautiful picture of fall and we're out in nature. And, and he looks down one road as far as he can, he says, to where it bent in the undergrowth and looks at the leaves on the ground. But really what that is about is it's about the many, many hundreds, thousands of times in our lives where we come to a fork. And we need to make a decision about which way to go. And this is a poem that is sometimes, I think, misinterpreted because at the end he says, you know, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. 
and that has made all the difference. Well, colloquially or, or, or you know, in terms of its connotation, often we think of that has made all the difference means, oh, that was great. You know, I became an artist, <laughs> I became a poet, mm -hmm. and that made, made all the difference. But what we have to remember about that poem is that, look at the title, you know, it's the road not taken. It's, that's, that's the road it's about. It's not about the road that he took. It's the road not taken. And um, what the poem does as, as, he descri as he goes through it is that he, he uses nature as the metaphor, as a springboard. And then he says, basically, we, again and again and again in life, we come to a fork in the road and we have to make a decision. But we have to make it, and that decision will be life-changing but we never have the information that we need to make that decision. Mm -hmm. But we can't just remain at the fork forever. We have to make a decision. We have to move on. Frost writes with sensitivity on the themes of, of doom and extinction. And as we discussed last time, he had experienced a number of losses in his life. Do you think that contributes to the way he writes about those those topics? I think it does. I think he was undoubtedly because he was so involved in his family's life. And I think he was um, clearly affected by all of the losses and by all the suffering. He was tremendously resilient to be able to continue on and continue to have such a public life and to be such a prolific poet. But I think it certainly did um, affect him. Probably one of his darkest poems is a poem called Design, and I think, uh, you know, in that poem, he really gets into speculation about how the world is really put together. I think that's one of the things that we all think about and that he, he spent a lot of time thinking about. And basically, that poem brings us to a scene in which there is a white moth and there is a white flower and there is a white spider. And... The color white is usually or often associated with innocence. And what's most interesting about, about it, I think, is that the, the spider is, is um, basically creating a kind of a web which ensnares the moth. And at the end of the poem, he asks questions. He says, what, what made the spider come to that place to build its web? What made the moth go that way. And he ends the poem by saying, what but design of darkness to appall if design govern in a thing so small? And I think what he's really trying to get at in that poem, it's a question, he never answers it, but it's a question where he says, you know, if there is a design in the universe, could it be actually kind of a, a malign design? I mean, how, how do all of these forces come together to, to result in such a bad outcome. And I'm sure, you know, he, he undoubtedly, as, as we all do, wondered how, how all of these factors came together to cause so much suffering in, in his life and in the life, lives of his family. Where do you think that we see some of Frost's influence on other writers, other poets? What's interesting about Frost's place in, in the literary canon is that it would be hard to find too many poets who are more important than Robert Frost. But it would also be hard um, to say this is, you know, some Frost, Frostian influence <laughs> on these, these later poets. But again, Dana Joya has suggested that in fact, uh, for for many years, you know, for, for decades, it seemed that Frost had a very minimal impact on, uh, on later poets until, uh, Joya argues, the 1980s when what he calls the new narrative uh, came forward. And in the poetry of, of people like Andrew Hudgens and Mark Jarman and Christian Wyman, uh, who are writing in this mode, Joya really hears uh, Frost's legacy. So it's it's very interesting because uh, so often we can say, oh, well, Walt Whitman, we can hear echoes of Whitman, for example, in the 20th century. But with Frost, it, it took a while before uh, we can say, oh, yes, that, that 
that kind of conversational narrative, yes, we see that coming up again. Dr. Christopher Bush, professor of English here at Hillsdale College, as we continue our series on Robert Frost. Next time, we'll look at a couple of specific works and some of his more well-known works and discuss those a bit. Dr. Bush, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Dr. John Fennell. Also, Joe Kennedy, his new book, Average Joe, One Man's Faith and the Fight to Change a Nation. And Dr. Chris Bush from Hillsdale's English Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.